Welcome, friends. It's almost midnight, and you've found your way to the Pikecast. Come along as we careen through the catalog of the most formative horror writer of our young adult days, Christopher Pike. From adult perspectives, we'll revisit these YA books our parents probably would never have let us read had they known what lie inside. We tackle one book per episode in a freewheeling and unbiased chat. So grab your battered paperback, pull the flashlight from the kitchen drawer, climb under your bed covers, and devour a good book with us. Greetings, fellow pikers, and welcome back to the PikeCast. I'm Cooper Beckett, and I'm thrilled to be joined by my lovely co-hosts, Hi, I'm Cassie. Hi, I'm Becca. And today we are talking about Christopher Pike's 1991 book, Whisper of Death. And we're going to be talking about it in great detail, spoiling each and every plot twist, so consider yourself warned. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review on the podcast service of your choice, as it is very helpful with promotion. And I want to welcome our guest piker this week, Claire C. Holland, author of the brilliant book of poetry, I Am Not Your Final Girl. So happy to have you here, Claire. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. We we love your book and we really wanted to have you here to talk about Pike. And we're very excited that you're here on episode two for Whisper of Death. Thank you so much. So I have a few questions for you before we get started. How did you discover Christopher Pike? Well, I um, I sort of, I have to say right from the outset that I sort of conflate Christopher Pike with some other authors that I know I read at the same time. <laughs> That's, so, that's not that's not uh, exclusive to you. A lot of people do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that like, um, I don't know, I was probably like in middle school when I started getting very into like Lois Duncan, who wrote I Know What You Did Last Summer, mm-hmm. and V.C. Andrews, who wrote the Flowers in the Attic series. <laughs> Oh, wow. You went you went all the way to V.C. Andrews. Man. Yes. So Christopher Pike, like, obviously works right in that genre. Um, and I just had, like, of course, probably like all of you guys, I was a huge reader when I was a kid. And I was just like, there's so many of those books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just went through a huge phase of just, like, tearing through them. Anything that seemed maybe a little too emotionally mature for me, I probably wanted to read. (laughs) That's, yeah. Yeah, Um, absolutely. And like a lot of the Christopher Pike books that I remember reading were about dying children. Um, There were a lot of ones about like kids who had terminal illnesses and things like that. So I guess I was just going through like, some time in my life where, you know, when you're just young and you want to read, you want to find out about all that stuff that you're not supposed to know about. So it was like a very taboo thing for me, even though my parents really didn't care. (laughs) Do you have any favorite Pike books? Well, I think that one of my favorites as a kid was called The Midnight Club, and it was about all of these terminally ill children. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, like telling scary stories to each other, I think. (laughs) That Um, that is, yeah, that's the Midnight Club. Yeah, I don't know. That one just really sticks in my head. Um, And Whisper of Death really stuck in my head, though I did not remember till I reread it how wild it is. (laughs) It, It is wild. It is wild. I mean, I honestly haven't thought about these books too much in a pretty long time. But like as soon as I went back to rereading that one, I was instantly transported back to just that that feeling that I was like reading something illicit. I think that's what I really loved as a kid. Yes. Yes. So much that. (laughs) I mean, and they're books for teenagers, but they really, really go places i mean they go into some like very very like mature dodgy 
territory. He was <laughs> unafraid situation. to push that, I think, you know? Yeah. And I, you know, kudos to a publisher for allowing him to do that while at the same time. And I think this book really, really reinforces what I see as the publisher's requirements because I feel like the moralization comes from his publisher. Oh, I'm because very there are curious times, about that actually. Yeah. Cause I thought about that a lot while I was reading it. So there are times when he, it seems like his voice is voicing one point of view, but then the narration of the book is voicing another point of view. And that point of view is see bad punishment. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's, that's probably the publisher oversight. I mean, we won't know until we, uh, fingers crossed, get him on the show to talk to us about that. But it's it's a really interesting dichotomy, and I I noted a number of passages in this book that reinforce that. So why don't we get right into the book? And I think Becca, you are going to be giving us the teaser this week. Yes. Okay. All alone. Help! I finally screamed. My voice echoed against the watching buildings until it became an echo of an echo and was lost. I buried my face in my hands, thankful that they at least had not deserted me. Tears filled my eyes, and I cried, but only qui quietly and to myself because there was no one there to share them with. I was not merely confused. I was lost, lost in a town I had lived in all my life. Time did not go by. That would have been a joke. Time had already packed his bags and left town. But something passed, and then after a while, I became aware that someone was standing above me. I raised my eyes. I had to look into the sun to see him, just like the first time. Just as I looked into the rising sun when I spotted the lone hitchhiker on the empty highway. Pepper, I said. Where is everybody? He asked. Yeah. That's, a, that's an intriguing teaser, I think. And now we're going to jump to the back of the book. And Cassie is going to give us the official description of Whisper of Death. <clears throat> so official. Okay. All the people had vanished. Roxanne and Pepper are a teenage couple with problems. They leave their small town for a weekend to try and solve them. They don't really succeed, and when they return home, they find their town empty. They call other towns. They find the whole world empty. But eventually, they discover three other kids their age who are still alive in the town. They cannot imagine why the five of them seem to be the only ones left of the entire race. <laughs> they have only one thing in common. They were each directly or indirectly involved in the death of Betty Sue the plain, shy girl who committed suicide only a short time ago. Betty Sue, the quiet, brilliant girl who wrote short stories about each of them. Stories of hate, of revenge, of death in a dead world. It makes them wonder who Betty Sue really was, or what Betty Sue was. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> so I want to talk about, oh, before spooky. we really delve into the book, um, how accurately do we feel that this captures what's inside the book because sometimes pike uh, descriptions are dodgy i think this one's accurate i think so too. Me too though it does gloss over some important <laughs> things yeah like, namely uh they leave their small town for a weekend to try to solve them their problems yeah just just uh you know abortion and such yeah, they make so. it seem like it's just like, uh, oh, we got to go pick up some furniture or something. Yeah, like they're know? going to a marriage retreat. Yeah. Think, you know. <laughs> That's one of my favorite things was when Rox was like, oh, just going for an ABT, kind of like a BLT. And I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like she really explained that well. Well, let's go into our our section, The Midnight Club where we talk about the characters from this book. And let's start with Rox, oh. Roxanne Wells. I, I really liked her. So she had she had some moments where, to me, I was like, girl, come on, you're being a little too weak here. But then she would turn mm -hmm. it around right away and be, like, super sarcastic, super witty, super like, I'm going to fuck shit up, you know? Like, here I come. And so I really loved yes. her. Yes. She she has a bit of that cadence of like a 1940s actress, you know, like uh, you, uh, Catherine Hepburn in, in a 1940s movie where it's quick-witted and uh, quick retorting. Yeah, I really got a lot of that from her. 
I agree. I really liked her too. And I definitely got that sense. And so she is our narrator for this book because it's a first person uh, story. And it, it does one of my, one of my least favorite uh, writing styles where it's a first person narrative being actually written from within the narrative. But overall, the fact that it's coming from her point of view allows us to get inside her head a lot more. And we, we feel her. And I was really struck in this book versus uh, Die Softly, how almost lyrical the voice is at times. You know, the, the, the quality of writing in this book is very different than Die Softly, I noticed. What do you three think of that? I, I agree with that. I think uh, Die Softly felt more male like it felt like it was more mm -hmm. from a male's perspective and it was because the protagonist that we were reading you know in that one is a guy and then here our our main person is Rox and she's she's a girl and and I know there there were a couple of times where I was like really like all right sure I would I don't know if I would pro probably think this but she was really relatable to me and I kind of liked that a little bit more than with Dysopoly because with that one I was like mm, I just don't like this guy <laughs> It's funny too, because I've noticed like in the, in the current crop of YA novels, uh, really since uh, Twilight, they present uh, a female protagonist that is not like they go out of their way to say she's nothing special. And I feel like that's done so that she becomes a blank slate that you can project yourself into. Mm -hmm. I think that's really true. And actually, now that you say that, I feel like that is one of the things that I kind of liked as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, that you could like project yourself into this very like her romance with Pepper at the beginning, at least is very just like something out of a movie. Like even their dialogue is just yeah. so kind of over the top almost, but in a way that I love. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to, you have to take into account that as the writer, is she telling us the truth? Mm -hmm. Is she remembering it, you know, in a, in a specific fancier way, or is it actually um, completely made up? Really? I do want to, I want to read a bit of her initial description where she describes herself, and this is really reinforcing what I was thinking about those protagonists in current YA. Uh, she says, I'm not pretty, I'm not smart, I'm nothing. Yet I knew I wasn't ugly or stupid. My hair was long and red, my eyes green and bright, a nice combination. I was too thin, I had no tits. But even girlfriends complimented me on my legs. Those same girls, however, said I didn't smile enough. I didn't like to smile because of my teeth. They were crooked and didn't shine like those of the actresses on TV. And we heard a so, little bit of that in the other book, too. The, the desperation okay, to look. Okay, I was just going to ask that. I remember crooked teeth from the last book, too. I think that's, you know, most, <laughs> I don't want to generalize, but many readers at this age are not what what some would term the beautiful people out there as cheerleaders and uh, quarterbacks, they're the people sitting at home reading instead of going out. And I know I was. I don't want to speak for, for you ladies, though. No, no, I'm right there with you. I was a freaking nerd, like a weird little like emo goth kid at home with my books and no friends. I am right there with you. <laughs> yeah, so, I stayed home and read on Fridays also. Yeah. <laughs> We could have so I, I was clothes. generalizing, yes, but, but <laughs> accurately. And she has a few of these things in the book. Like, I could tell he was enjoying the sight of my legs. They were good ones. <laughs> it's, it's like she's, she's chosen this defining characteristic. And I think that's really cool because it is a, a pretty common thing. Like I know I have that where it's like, I, I believe that this part of me is really good. Even if everything else I think is thoroughly mediocre. For me, honestly, that part actually that you mentioned about the legs, that was part of the thing that for me personally, as um, 
like a female reader, I was like, I cannot imagine ever feeling so confident that I'm like, that guy's checking out this part of my body and I know it looks good. Like I have never, and that could just be me like coming from a place of insecurity. But when reading, I was like, that's not something I've ever thought. Like that's not (laughs) something I'm familiar with. I feel like that was written by a dude. (laughs) I agree at least so far as this is a high school student, right? Yes, she's 18. She's young. Yeah, I mean, I never felt that confident in high school for sure. (laughs) I definitely felt that that's, I mean, I totally, I actually do completely understand what you're saying, Cooper. I do feel that a lot more now, I think. Like, I know what works Mm -hmm. for me and what doesn't, but I think as a teen, not at all. But it was another, it was another thing that I liked about rocks in this book. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I didn't. I think it made her more a little, uh, her character a little bit stronger because it made her seem more okay with herself and like how she would go and sit on that rock and do her own thing. Like she's like, I don't need other people. Maybe some romance and some, you know, little something might be nice, but I'm out here smoking on Tuesdays, having some junk food snacks. Like I'm living mm-hmm. my life. She's she's another one of the uh, Pike heroes who enjoys junk food. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm true. I'm curious if every one of the people we're supposed to like in Pike's books are junk food fans. I'm a junk food fan, so if so, Same. I'm okay with it. Yeah, <laughs> really I'm, I'm right there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to Paul Poinsel, also known as Pepper. Did we ever get an explanation to his nickname? No, she was confused of why he was called Pepper. Okay, I was like hoping maybe he would have said something like, "Hey, this is why I'm Pepper." Because like, I just I just want to know. No, she specifically so mentions that like he didn't have dark freckles, uh, and so it's like, oh, okay, so we know why he's why he's not called Pepper, but we don't know why he is called. I feel Pepper. like he's only called Pepper so that um our villain. Betty Sue can write her story, Salt and Pepper. Like, I really okay. am convinced that's why his name is Pepper. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, one thing that I find very interesting about their relationship is in, in the early part of the, the uh, return to town, they're going for ice cream. And Pepper and Rocks... While, while they talk about how Stan's getting chocolate chip and, you know, really enjoying himself, Pepper and Rocks share a cup of vanilla ice cream. <laughs> and yes, I feel like really these two are pretty vanilla. Here. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think Rocks is, but I think their relationship is very standard. <laughs> I agree. I agree too. So what did you think of Pepper? As a as a kid, when I read this for the first time, I remember liking him and thinking, oh, like he's such a dreamy guy. She just has to love him a little harder. You know, like, <laughs> I know. Oh, wow. Isn't that bananas now? I know. Right? And like, you know, when I think about it too, because I, as a teenage girl, I had some crappy boyfriends who like were like, yeah, I'm kind of into this, but not really, you know, whatever. And meanwhile, I'm mm-hmm. over here writing love notes and like daydreaming oh, about a future. So I know. Cute. Look, I'm being real with you guys here. Like no, this, like hey, Cassie, this is a safe space. <laughs> okay, yeah, this is so reading this now as an adult, I'm like, fucking punch him. Like, he's horrible. Right, like, yeah. He doesn't love you, girl. Go. Like, you can do so much better. Like, I am so much more like not about Pepper in this version. We <laughs> love character development, Cassie. Like, you did well. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> Look at me growing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, he, he's kind of a douche. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan. A and like over, like it's it's funny uh, because we get a lot of Rox's point of view with this jealousy that keeps coming up for her. Like, why why is he, uh, you know, giving giving uh, Leslie right, Leslie? Oh shit, Leslie. Oh, Leslie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like the comforting hugs, though, right? Like all those well, comforting hugs. hugs her, his his handkerchief, which is disgusting. Oh, yeah, uh, I know. Yeah, like we get all this jealousy from from rocks, and then uh, you know he's all pissy that she's being mean to him on the day that they went for an abortion, and the world disappeared, and she gets shot. 
A, an abortion she didn't even want. Yeah. So, so I mean, like, <laughs> he's he's just he's a he's a little extra. I think <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Let's move on to Stan, who fulfills the fat person quotient of the book. Poor Stan. Stan. I felt bad for Stan. Me too. I mean, he's clearly the character the author identifies with. <laughs> Stan was definitely my fave. Like you, we need to get a man like Stan Screw Pepper. Yeah, yeah, I'm here for that. Well, and, and apparently, at the end of Stan's life, Rox always had a crush on him. That you know, so if that's cute. what I hear at the end of my life, it's like, <laughs> fuck you for telling me that. I yeah. didn't need to know that right now. I kind of don't believe that she did, though. I think that she was just trying to like comfort him while he was dying. I kind of got that vibe too. Yeah. Why didn't it come up yeah. before? <laughs> right. Like there would have well, been because some he was short and us. chubby. Aww. I think it's that like sweet boy. Have you guys? Have you guys seen Wet Hot American Summer? <laughs> yes. Where, you know, the girl who she says, you're such a great guy, but, you know, the Paul Red guy, he's hot. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty sometimes much it, yeah. It's just like that simple. It's sad, though. Well, so yeah, sometimes you just got to choose Paul Rudd. And you know what? I get that. <laughs> I mean, I'm a Me fan too. of Paul Rudd, so honestly, Paul Rudd, yeah. it, he, is, he is an attractive man. <laughs> And he doesn't age. He just looks the same from no, he doesn't age. now. Like it's it's bananas. It's so wild. He's he's a beautiful person. Really is. <laughs> so back to Stan. <laughs> right, right, right. We love Stan. Who, uh, Christopher Pike goes out of his way to tell us is not a beautiful person. His brown eyes were huge because his glasses were thick. His pleasant plump face was a haven of sanity, but he has dirty blonde hair. He's you know, it's, it's, uh, let's see. I'm the class nerd. He says, nerds don't go on dates. They're just happy if a girl wants him, wants them to help them with their homework. Oh, yeah. Seriously. Such a sweet boy. He's the nice guy archetype there. He is. And then she shits on him for really liking ice cream. He had a banana split and a malt. He right, had a I rather see- major problem with his weight. What the There's, fuck is right, that? There is no problem <laughs> with a having day. a malt and a banana split. Treat like yourself. when the yeah. world is gone. It's really rude. <laughs> yeah, it's a little rough on poor Stan. Even if he is the guy who figures literally everything out in this. <laughs> And he was manipulated the entire time. I was going to say, he never nice even guy. did anything wrong, right? No. <laughs> no, he, he didn't. When they explain it, I'm pretty sure they're just, like, when he explains it about why he has to die, he's like, oh, well, I knew who she was and liked her anyway, so I had to die. Like, what? What? <laughs> no. <laughs> we, we will definitely get into a little bit of the hinkiness with the the uh, – the villain machinations here when, when we get to our eternal enemy section, I feel like, because I have questions. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Helter Skater, which is, I mean, I was just annoyed every time we, we said his name because it is basically Helter Skelter. And that's just annoying to me. <laughs> True. Who names their Who was not annoyed? Because they'll be better at talking about this. He reminded me of Theo, except more like rough Theo. Like, not sweet Theo, but rough Theo. Like, he was like, I've got guns. I'm not afraid to use them. I'm wild. Yeah, yeah. Also, like, I'm I'm a a jerk. Like, I'm a bad person, though. Like, I'm not a great guy. I basically just pictured Bender from um, Breakfast Club the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, just just Judd Nelson. Oh, yeah, definitely. When you said Bender at first, I'm going to be honest, and I thought you were talking about Futurama. From Futurama. I, like, I don't know if that's what I would see for that. <laughs> I mean, you know. I think he's a robot now? He, he does continually say to bite his shiny metal ass, so I don't know what to think. Personality-wise, maybe he is on point. <laughs> but yeah, you know, you're right. He is very much like Theo. He is, he is unpredictable. He shows up randomly. He has guns. Mm-hmm. And he, I mean, he's just like literally if in, he's just bad boy. It's like, okay, leather jacket, 
bad boy, uh, hair, bad boy. It's just, that's it. That's what he is, 100%. And he's the kind of guy that in a different book, Rox would be strangely attracted to. I actually really, like, after, like, when we were introduced to Helter Skater, I wasn't really the biggest fan of him. But, like, as time went on, mm-hmm. I really felt for him, especially when, like, he's like, can we be part friends to Pepper? And I was like, that is really sweet, and I would love to be his part friend. <laughs> like, I don't know why, but it, like, really warmed my heart. And, like, his whole, like, dying, like, that really got me, man. I, I just felt weird about his, like, aggressive liking of Leslie. Oh yeah, like yeah. like just it, it wasn't it wasn't subtle it wasn't comfortable it was aggressive. Right, I feel the like they tried thing. softening it up a little bit when she died, and they were like, "Oh, I think he cared more than he like mm. was acting." <laughs> I don't know, not to defend him or anything, but I don't know. <laughs> no, no, you can defend. You was, can like him. It's I think okay. I might actually really like him now that we're talking about okay. it. <laughs> but he's still I no stand. You like honestly. I thought he was just funny. I thought there is this one quote I wrote down where he just said, after he shot rocks, I think he said, who has time to be sorry with all this weird crap going on? <laughs> I feel like that kind of summed up his character. That's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> I think I was personally a little bit conflicted on him because I know. So obviously like the elephant in the room or whatever is that he raped Betty Sue. And so Ooh, who was like the I antagonist and, no, I did forget and, so, I, and, and I know. And so, in, and I was, <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't know if they remember in the bad part of the story <laughs> here. Hang on. And so, and I was like, I don't know if I want to bring this up. I'm sorry guys, but <laughs> no, yeah, that's, I, I, so, I feel that's um, an important point. Yeah. But, and I will say in the story, they do explain, um, not, I don't want to say explain cause that seems to justify it, but it, it, they do, tell that Betty Sue had him under some sort of influence or some sort of spell that made him act a different way. So, you know, there is that, but for me personally, just that as a thing was really, I didn't like him. And so by the end, when he was dying, I was like, bye bye, bitch. Like, that's it for you. I'm not going to see you anymore. Like that was really. (laughs) (laughs) But again, that ties into that discussion later of what the fuck was Betty Sue's actual. Yeah. Manipulative. That's That's where I'm a little hazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, even when they wrapped it up and she was monologuing at the end, it's like, wait a minute. So what happened? <laughs> but but that's that's for future discussion. So let's let's move on to Leslie Bell. She was a beauty and she was successful, got good grades, starred in every play at Salem High and glowed, according to Rocks. She had bones and teeth that spelled sun and fun. I don't know what that means. <laughs> right, what does that mean? Like skulls on the island or something? Yeah. Like, <laughs> And a body that made most guys think party time. Oh, wow. Oh. But she wasn't loose, <laughs> at least not from what I'd heard. And I even more that. remarkable, she wasn't a snob. <laughs> Just. <laughs> my, my note there is literally he he. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of LOLs in my margins. <laughs> um, so for Leslie, like uh, how she was introduced is kind of like Rox wants to dislike her because she's like this epitome of like popular, perfect, you know, girl. And she can't because she's actually like a nice person. But as we get to know her, she's mm-hmm. not like that nice. She's not there's nothing about her that seems nice to me. Like she doesn't she's whiny the entire time, even though they're all dealing with the same problem. She just cries and complains. She needs to be comforted constantly where there's this other person who's like, just, you know, stepping up and taking charge and doing difficult things. Um, and so I just didn't like her. Like, I I was like, I'm so I feel like they want me to like her, but I don't like, there's nothing likable here. And then, you know, a bad thing happens to her and I'm like, all right, well, (laughs) yeah. And she, I mean, she is easily the least defined. (laughs) I'm sorry. I, I look, I like rocks and you know, <laughs> the end of this book. <laughs> I think it was kind of so, neat that yeah. Leslie is like defined as like the popular character. However, she's not really like in your face as much as like the cheerleaders and um, die softly, you know, like, cause usually when you have a popular right. character, they're like in front and center, like, and the main character is constantly talking about them and whatnot. So I think it was cool that she was still kind of in the background. 
but not and America. I, yeah, I think kind that's of. what what he was shifting with here was that shifting away from the standard because, like he mm-hmm. he talks about in interviews, how he was initially told, "Look, the the books with the the blonde." Uh, protagonist on the cover they sell better make your hero the blonde protagonist and he's definitely shifted with this and i think that's really cool so are we ready to move into remember me our plot discussion yes Uh, okay so elephant in the room this book is about abortion (laughs) and yeah, it 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 it's hard to reconcile that right now, as it's an incredibly simple abortion procedure she is getting, and she is punished by dying from it. Yeah, it goes terribly wrong. Yeah, so like when when I heard that Pike was had written a script for a whisper of death movie and he's hoping to get it made. I really, really hope they either tone that down or make it very clear that the interior of the book is real because one of those two things can't be true. Either the interior of the book is really happening and then Betty Sue killed her or the interior of the book is completely in Rox's mind and she literally just died from the simplest abortion procedure ever. Yeah. Which would be awful. <laughs> yeah. So what do you I think? I didn't even think about that, that it could all be in her head. I yeah. was like, Oh, we're into mystical witchy stuff here. Here we go. This is fact. But like, Oh no. What if she just dreamed all that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this entire book really was like a mind fun. fuck. Yeah, I would hate if they turned it into a movie and then it was all just in her head and she died in the abortion. Cause... Right. Oh, well, I mean, and I think the book, in fairness, I think the book does not take that point of view. It's I don't just care. definitely there. Yeah, I think know? it's just a little confusing at times, but I agree. Mm-hmm. So we're all on team. The empty world actually happened. Betty Sue is actually witchy or a god or whatever she is i definitely where i'm going yeah i think that they're all dead and that she's got them trapped in some sort of limbo forever to punish them and maybe rocks by the end then maybe that means she escaped the limbo and then still died (laughs) yeah because they're all already dead because she's aborting her baby because that's obviously and we have to punish that yeah 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 this book is so confusing, honestly, about how it is trying to portray abortion. It really seems to go back and forth a lot. Yeah. It does. yeah. When and that was probably... part of what I was thinking yeah. with uh, his point of view versus a publisher point of view, I feel like uh, – so Dr. Adams, the the uh, doctor there, at at one point says, you think about what you want to do. Talk to your father and your boyfriend if you wish – but don't let anyone make the decision for you. And that feels like a really real feeling in the, in the writing of this book, rather than a a perfunctory, Hey, look, this doctor doesn't care if you kill your baby. I agree. I was really um, surprised that the doctor was so great about it. Yeah. Yeah. Because it didn't I mean, jive with a lot of the rest of the book. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, like there's a, there's a lot of talk about sanctity of life um, where Roxanne says she did not notice anything particular in the fact that she could contemplate the sanctity of life while simultaneously cutting short the life of a fetus. Ah, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh. Well, and at one point she says, I didn't cry. It was a miracle. It was a gift from God. I threw up instead. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, I guess that does accurately maybe show how you might feel at that moment. <laughs> yeah. Especially yeah. if you don't 
if you're not pro-abort, you know, pro-choice, or if you just don't want to do it, she didn't want to do it, I guess. So that's true. That's true. And and that was one of the problems. I mean, I it's very high school. I get it. You know, it's very 18 year old thinking. I get that, Mm -hmm. that you've just met someone and the timeline is all wonky in this book, by the way, it, it appears that she's pregnant and having the abortion within five weeks of meeting, uh, Pepper. Yeah. Because she meets Pepper, they have sex, then Pepper, uh, has sex with Betty Sue, then Betty Sue dies, and it's made very clear this is four weeks later from that. So, I'm that's that's one of the reasons I feel like it's it's so high school. And there's there's a great line uh, that Rox says about how how about if we call her Pebbles after the baby girl on the Flintstones, and it's like wow. That is that is one of the most immature reasons to name <laughs> your child. So yeah, totally high schooler. Yeah, eighteen year old. Totally, you're in love forever. Very true. <laughs> Clearly, I'm judgmental about their belief in eternal love for as eighteen year olds. Well, I mean, Pepper is not the one to hang her hopes on. I don't think. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> Though even that's a little bit hazy. I'm a little bit confused about whether he cheated on her on or whether I he was under an influence or <laughs> Yeah, it 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 gets weird. <laughs> yeah, it he gets says, really weird. He said he didn't even want to do it and that he didn't even like her, but he like he had to. Yeah. yeah. So that but wasn't that would be a very convenient thing? thing for someone to say who, was who just cheated on his girlfriend. Right. So we can't really. And she lied know. about it so many times. Yeah. I, I didn't know so what to many think. Times. <laughs> the, she gave the him so constant, many opportunities. Yeah, the constant let's not talk about this. Yeah. It's like, okay, everybody really doesn't want to talk about this, but it's clear that this is the most important thing happening right now. So maybe we should talk about this. One thing that I really did, I mean, to go on the abortion discussion, the when when uh, Rox kills Helter, her her conflict really feels like that is an abortion allegory. What do you think of that? Oh, Silence. I agree. <laughs> I completely agree. <laughs> and I thought I that part was it, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and it again reinforces that like she's the only person even vaguely in control here yeah. in this uh alternate world. I'm just trying to find But she that says, I pulled the trigger, I killed him, I never knew I could kill someone, but then I remembered I had gone for an abortion only that morning. Maybe it had prepared me. So that yeah. gives us a little bit of anti-abortion sentiment, but also it gives us the abortion allegory that she is able to kill someone. Which is funny because she hadn't, in her mind, she hadn't even done the abortion that morning. Yeah, she just went there. That's and it. She That's all that it. happened. <laughs> yeah. It, it really doesn't quite know the point it's making. Yeah. I think, as, I think as a, so. And that that really speaks to me of a conflicted author. Because, you know, if he goes to the publisher and says, okay, I have this story uh, where a girl is getting an abortion and she winds up in this world where there's people trying to kill her, like, you know, the publisher is going to say, well, you need to make it very clear that sex is bad, the abortion is bad, and all these things. And he he agreed to that because, I mean, this is 91 also, you know, abortion wasn't really uh, being strongly talked about. Though I, I want to mention the one time in my life that I had a discussion about an abortion, I literally remembered the price from this book as being the price that might have to be paid. <laughs> and How like $460 or something. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, 
I honestly have no idea if that was the price then, <laughs> but that was what I thought. I was like, okay, I got to get four hundred and sixty dollars together. I think I rounded up because for me, when I was a teenager, for some reason, I had the idea that it was five hundred dollars, and like that was just a flat abortion fee for anybody <laughs> yeah, who needed to know. Just a standard across the board, yeah. abortion fee. And I, it must have been from this book, but I didn't even realize that until just now. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't realize it until I was reading the price. And it's just like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I feel like a lot of my ideas of abortion actually came from this book, which is fucked up. <laughs> I do want to mention there's a line uh, that that she says, nobody, no one had written a getting ready for my abortion song. And I just want to point out that no, they hadn't in 1991, but uh, six or seven years later, Brick was released and Brick is about getting ready for an abortion. Ta-da! Look at Christopher Pike predicting the future. I know. <laughs> He's just like Ben Folds was like, yeah, I got that. <laughs> Okay, let's let's oh, slide wait, past I know the abortion. What you're talking about now? That's a sad song. Oh, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is, yeah. and it's it's definitely about abortion. And people try to talk you out of that. And it's like, no, actually, listen to the lyrics. Definitely, it, definitely. Yeah, it is so about abortion. <laughs> yeah. So sliding past abortion, we have the um, the sort of sci-fi horror dream scenario the plague or uh zombie apocalypse or whatever causes the world to be empty and you are here and can do whatever you want you know i like i i feel like the stand is in here i feel like dawn of the dead is in here and any number of other stories but this really it is a it is a story we've heard before but it is told in a very unique way. I am so confused by the entire plot, to be honest. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, let's for, talk okay. About so that. I have a I have a big question. So you know how yeah. Betty Sue was pregnant, or she said she was pregnant. Did she like transfer the baby <laughs> to? I wondered um, that myself. Yeah, like when she hands her the carved soap. Like, is that her being like, yeah. well? Here's a baby. <laughs> like, <laughs> now it's like, I'm problem. just so confused. <laughs> I'm so confused. I was by like, it. is Betty Sue the baby? I right, like, that I confused me really too. <laughs> and, and, and like, this did she is, intentionally uh, die to become the baby? <laughs> yeah, I. I mean, there is so much that I don't understand about Betty Sue's Endgame. Yeah. And considering, like, in our last book, we got literally a point-by-point -point explanation mm -hmm. of literally every element of the bad guy's plan. I miss Alexis And so we much. sort of get that in this one, but her plan is very confusing, and it doesn't actually add up. Well, and, and I don't then, understand, yeah. like, who's yeah, going to hurt? I'm sorry, but... It's no, no, no. Confusing at the end. The only one I can even see who kind of did her wrong was Leslie, I guess, maybe by like not being appreciated maybe, yeah. or something. But it seemed like it's... everybody else was fine, mostly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, un until she made them rape her or, right. or get her pregnant yeah. or like it's, <laughs> it's, that is the weirdest message of all of this because it seems like all the violence that was done to her. Not she was asking for. She actually made happen. Right. Like, why would you want yeah. that? Like, why? Would, I'm so confused. I, I Buddy's mean, she got me could, messed up. She could have that that victim complex. You know, if she feels like uh, she's going to be abandoned, she can make people abandon her to prove her right about going to be abandoned. Yeah, and they did say that, like, when she had when she like enticed or whatever helped her to come over. Yeah. Um, they said that like he, they think he surprised even her. Like she, she wanted him to do stuff to her, I guess, but then he did more than she was even expecting. And she was angry about it. It was just yeah. confusing. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> 
I I was I was very confused about about her motivations and machinations. I think that she she's hard to understand because I don't think she's well. Like I I don't think she has a clear cut idea of what she wants or what she wants to do because I think she's somebody who was hurt from a very young age by the mm-hmm. people around her that she cared for and trusted and and maybe so from my perspective like I read the book and just automatically assumed that the magical sort of element or whatever power she had was fact. So from my perspective, like there's this little girl who discovers she can do something through writing that she tries to help her best friend with makes her pretty. She's suddenly popular. She's suddenly beautiful. She immediately ditches the girl who got her there. So there are probably a lot of bad feelings that she's feeling and like just she's been abandoned. She's been betrayed. She she has no power, even though she does have power. So now every everything that she does, like in like you said, how she caused Helter to kind of come onto her or do something with her and then it got out of their both control. They even say like multiple times, like she can't control people like in the world that way. Like it's only when they're in that little small sort of metaphorical jar. Um mm-hmm. So things just get out of hand for her every single time. So every connection that she makes, everything she tries to do, maybe it's not intentionally like her trying to hurt people or do anything bad at first, but it just keeps leading to negative results because she's not doing it with like pure intention. She's not trying to make friends. She's not trying to make connections. She's trying to control the people around her and you can't. And after all of this hurt kind of piles up, she's like, look, fuck this. Like, I don't care if little, like my little friend over here, nice faced Stan is nice to me. I want them all to die. Like, cause she's broken maybe at that point. Yeah. There's so much bad that's just happened to her that she can't. There's no reason. It's just, I want them all to die. And now they're stuck in this terrible, like repetitive, like, Hey, what's up? You kind of remember me. You're going to suffer, you know, like, I don't know. (laughs) I thought it was sad. And so I didn't, I agree that it was very confusing, but I also was like, she's just not well, like this isn't supposed to make sense for me. There's no way for me to understand why she's doing this, which is different from Alexa, who I did understand a little bit more in the last book. Yeah. Alexa was just a sociopath. She wasn't (laughs) off like right this. exactly yeah and there was no magical element there of course too so that is a little bit different as well but yeah I, I i felt like less than malicious she was just broken and hurt and bad like that way not evil necessarily is just yeah. hurt i think that makes sense hurt people hurt people you know yes I agree. <laughs> yeah and i i think that's that that's a big theme for this too maybe yeah, really, uh, all all across the board is is thematic. Let's talk about the stories, and I have to say that rereading Holt Skater takes a walk. <laughs> I I have literally remembered two things about Christopher Pike since the moment I read them. One that abortion can kill you. <laughs> And two, there's a guy who gets cut in half after walking on a wall that's razor sharp. I didn't remember context. I just remembered that. So rereading that little story, I was, it, it blew me away. It was like all of those things coming back. And it's like, <laughs> yes, this is so visceral and freaky. It is very freaky. I think all that was one of the things that I loved so much as a kid was that it just was freaky. <laughs> yeah. It and and they're mean and they're dark. Yeah. Like when when Laddie Ball puts on a mask and she blows out the candles and the cake catches fire because it's wood and the mask is part of her face and she looked like death and it's just like so matter of fact and fucked up. It's like, whoa, 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 yeah. what are we doing? I love how matter of fact it is. It makes it so much more creepy. Yeah. And the way it's written is pretty creepy too because like they mentioned in the story, they're not it's not written like a normal story. It's kind of written like a spell almost or like a yeah. chant that she's it's like repetitive and, and spooky and like, uh, it's those stories are creepy. I love the stories within the stories that Pike does too, because he does that in a lot of his books and I love them. So yeah, so these, bonus. these four stories are just fascinating little pieces of this greater story. And, uh, the, the, but, but, 
specifically for me, it's that whole skater one. And, and just here's a quick shout out to our patrons who are going to get audio recordings of me reading all four stories for them and only them. Yeah. Nice. Okay. The Pike cast has to take a quick break. We will be right back. Friends, where else can you get this kind of programming than the Pikecast? Nowhere, that's where. But we're trying to keep the lights on here. If you like what you're hearing and want it to keep happening, jump over to our Patreon at thepikecast.com slash Patreon and throw us a few bucks to join our private Discord server. Higher tiers get books, stickers, bookmarks, and even personalized shirts. That's thepikecast.com slash Patreon. Once, Osgood and Frost were the up-and-coming stars of the burgeoning paranormal investigation TV show craze before a hoax put an end to their friendship, partnership, and television careers. Now, over a decade later, Prudence Osgood is a barely functioning alcoholic ghost hunter for hire. Her yearning for mystery and adventure is reignited when she receives a cryptic, untraceable email. She can't resist embarking on an investigation that tugs threads, winding through a sinister series of disappearances, her former partner's family, and a night 20 years ago when a semi blew a yellow light and nearly killed her. Reviewers are calling As Good As Gone a masterfully vulnerable and relatable 21st century horror story and a bourbon-soaked supernatural mystery with sparkling dialogue that sticks the landing on LGBT characters and main character Prudence Osgood, as tortured as she is clever, broken in all the best ways, and a true heroine for our times. Buy it today at As Good As Gone as a paperback or ebook. And watch for the audiobook narrated by me, J.J. Ranvier, this Halloween. Hello, Pikers. Are you enjoying the Pikecast? Good. Do you have Pike books at home? If so, show us on social media using hashtag show us your Pike. And welcome back to the Pikecast. Now we're moving on to our section, The Eternal Enemy, where we give our thoughts on the antagonist and overall enemy of the book, and did it work for us? So we've talked a lot about Betty Sue McCormick now, who did self-immolation before the book starts, yet is the overall antagonist of the entire book. I want to talk about Fat Freddy. Who is Fat Freddy? That's what I want. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Part of me, I don't know why I wrote this down. So, um, but there was something in the book that made me think like is Fat Freddy like her a fictional version of Stan, but then they call him Soda later in like mm. her story. But like I was getting like I was thinking for a minute that it might have been Stan, but like I okay. don't know. I mean, that doesn't make sense now that we finished the book. <laughs> okay. But, like, while I was reading it, I was like, wait a minute. So, I don't know. Because he knew her for a while, what too. What a rude like, name to have given yeah. him, too, if it was. Yeah. When I when I, I realized know. they weren't going to explain Fat Freddy, like, at the end, because t- t- we're getting to the end, and he has still not been explained, I started to think that he might be the devil that gave her her powers. Because he's mentioned in one of the four stories as, as an, adv- I, I don't remember which one. I think it's Soda Radar, but he's also mentioned earlier in the book, like Fat Freddy is coming back or something like that. And I mean, you put the word Freddy in a book, you're going to think of Freddy Krueger, but Fat Freddy, it's just, there's. There's something that feels like, you know, the devil at the crossroads there about that to me. 
I kind of wish Leslie, because Leslie knew obviously quite a bit about Betty Sue and like her powers, and I kind of wish that she would have done more. And refused to tell us. Yeah, she was just like, you'll find out soon enough. And I'm like, can you just tell me who Fat Freddy is? Like, that's all I want to know. No, I have to set myself on fire. I was very annoyed with Leslie through this, to be honest, because I was like, you are you seem to know the most, and you're going to yeah. drive to L.A. Right. She when there's no one else her. in the world? <laughs> it was just strange, and I, I just wished she had helped more. <laughs> Too. Yeah. I think she really could have done well at explaining to us like what was going yeah. on. <laughs> so Betty Sue uh describes herself as um she is human, but a human can be many things. A human can be a witch, a sorcerer, a saint, a god. And then she gets into this meta thing that would irritate me in a book that I didn't enjoy more. I am the author. I am the storyteller. I am all that there is. She's a little full of herself, isn't she? She she is. She does say, um, I am a devil so powerful, even God leaves me alone to play as I wish. That's wild. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yeah kind of I terrifying. think... It is spooky. And I think a little bit to go back to the Fat Freddy thing, too, is because like in the beginning when they're reading her diary entries, she says something like, um, I don't have the exact part highlighted, but it was like he thought he was better or like he he thought he was bigger than the God who created him or something like that. And yeah, yeah. I was like, did she make him then? Because she said that he left when she became a woman and started like thinking unpure thoughts or something like that. Like, I don't know. She just seemed like. Oh, I created everything. I can do all of this stuff. I'm better than everybody else. Like I'm God. And it was just so off putting for me. Yeah, and thinking totally. like she was hurt and stuff. It's just like, ugh, like I don't like it. <laughs> I mean, I had the, I had the briefest of inclinations that the fra- the fat Freddy plot line was going to be about, uh, sexual abuse hmm. because of the way she mentioned that in her diary. And was just like, oh, I I really hope they tell us what this is. It gave yeah. me yeah. those vibes too. Yeah, which I mean, if you if you take that down the path, that makes Fat Freddy very similar to the way Reagan talked about Captain Howdy in The Exorcist, mm-hmm. and you could you could believe that this entity essentially abused her. And made her into what she is. I think that's actually a really good guess, though I don't think it's obvious at all. <laughs> oh, no, it's not obvious. But I no, think this that's is... a good guess. <laughs> yeah, no, I think so too. And maybe when she says like she ate Fat Freddy or something, like maybe she had already yes. written a story for him to something bad had happened to him off off the page that we don't know about. Mm-hmm. Huh. Like there's more there. Like Pike, come back and write us a, a prequel. Give us more. Maybe the maybe the publisher cut it out or something in editing. Like maybe there was more about Fat Freddy, and they were like, yeah. "Nah, we don't need it. I need it." Yeah. Well, that's we'll add that to the things we want to ask Pike about. Yes, Fat Freddy, please. <laughs> what the hell is Fat Freddy about? <laughs> so did uh, did Betty Sue work as a villain? I mean, we talked about how her plan doesn't make any sense, but. I felt she was a very strong antagonist overall. She was scary. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. she was definitely. She like made a whole lonely world to match how she felt. And that's like, that's some crazy power. Like, Yeah, that's kind of cool, actually. (laughs) Kind of. Yeah, it's kind of Scarlet Witchy in a way. And I kind of like almost like her at the same time as not liking her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she does that thing with the butterflies initially where she just puts them in the jar and sets them in the sun. Hurt people, hurt butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, this is one of those instances where I really want to hear what our listeners think about what her end game was and what the plan was and what in the world I was the one in your womb. I came back for you. You were pregnant with me. Mother means. <laughs> yeah. Why would you want to be a baby again? Yeah. Why? Like you killed yourself to become a baby. But will- then she specifically says that she had to abort the baby 
to bring her back. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it it's just perplexing, but but it works for the novel that we don't understand what she's doing because it also follows a level of dream logic, I think. Maybe she just wanted to be loved and she wanted Pepper and Rox to be her new mom and dad. And she hoped that that would be a happy ending. But in the event that they decided to, you know, nip it in the bud, she's like, all right, you're going in the jar now. End of everything. That could be. It's just so strange. It gets so confusing when I think about Pepper being the father, but then he also slept with Betty Sue. Yes. (laughs) Who's the father of her baby or was that Helter? I don't know. They don't I, I mean, she told Pepper he was the father. Yeah. But, was that but true? it could have been Helter because we have no idea what the timeline was. Yeah. <laughs> the, there was one line that I really liked when she says to Pepper, your seed is like a disease inside me. Oh it's a catching disease. I might cough and give it to someone else. I might do that on purpose. I'm sure whoever catches it next will die. Sorry, so Ross. she definitely passed. So she's the baby implying, off. yeah, she's implying she can cough Pepper's seed on. Oh my uh, gosh! <laughs> and get her pregnant. I don't know. It's so weird though because they only slept together, Rocks and Pepper, one time, and she yeah. saw it happen. She stumbled upon it. She didn't know it was happening until she saw it. Right. So if he impregnated her, then that wouldn't have had anything to do with Betty Sue, but. If he didn't, then maybe she was like, now you're going to suffer, and now you have my soap, baby, and I'm rubbing myself in the mirror. <laughs> like, <laughs> which by itself, can we talk about that, like, that image of her standing in the mirror, yes. this girl with flaming red hair, this thin, pale girl, rubbing red, like, soapy material onto her stomach. Like, that's so fucking creepy. That is so creepy. That was one of the <laughs> creepiest parts for me, honestly. And then when she yes. gives her the little soap baby, it was just weird. Yeah, I would say, I would say, especially the way they talk, like, Rox talks about not wanting to get, uh, to shower with the other girls and, and not being comfortable. And then to not be comfortable and have this person you barely know walk up to you and hand you a soap carving of a fetus while you're naked and she's naked. And oh my God, that's terrifying. It's so uncomfortable. Yeah. And how did she not remember this immediately when Betty Sue came up again? Like, yes. when you said Betty yes. Sue, how do you not think naked in the mirror, rubbing your belly? That like, is something that I would be my go to. That is my go to. <laughs> <laughs> because Betty Sue wrote her unable. I don't know. <laughs> well, like, I we can't explain it. I felt really bad for Rox because she never did anything to Betty Sue. So, and it doesn't even really yeah. seem like Pepper did much to her either so i just don't know why she chose these two people to force to carry her as a baby (laughs) it's so i mean there's a lot of whys here (laughs) i i did find that passage uh that you mentioned cassie but he left when i changed into a young woman and dreamed of sin he was too fat for my tastes and i had him for supper because he thought he was bigger than the God who created him. Oh, wait, maybe that is Stan then. Because maybe she made him smarter and like good at writing, remember? And then he, he like in the story, he brought her a story that wasn't real or something. I don't know. So she, she created him, maybe she feels like. And then she's like, well, when I started dreaming of doing these bad things or something, I don't know. I'm trying to make sense of this witchy woman <laughs> over here who's I, grasping I like, at straws. I like what you're putting down because it, like, validates me. <laughs> so thank you. Because <laughs> I truly could not figure out. I was like, why did I write that down? I can't remember why I thought Stan was fat brownie at all. But... So I guess, listeners, we also want to know who the fuck you think Fat Freddy is. <laughs> tell us your Fat Freddy theories. Just we need me, them. Tell me everything, because I don't know what happened in this book at all. So. <laughs> <laughs> I am so confused. And Becca, this is your second ever I Pike know. book. So just as for our listeners and for us, what do you think so far about Christopher Pike in this Honestly, book? <laughs> yes. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this one was a ride like i i read it and i'm like the whole time i'm reading it i'm like what like i just i don't know <laughs> like, i have no idea i do kind of want to like say that i do like the fact 
that he is making us have this discussion because we have no idea what's going on. Like, I think it's neat that, yeah. like, he's not answering everything, I guess. Although I do want answers. Where most most uh, young adult fiction goes out of its way to literally answer every possible question. Yes. Yeah. So I do kind of like the fact that, like, we, like, like, when Cassie was saying how when she started reading this book again, um she automatically was like okay magic is is magic like it has to be magic whereas like mm -hmm. not everyone is thinking that <laughs> and like i don't know like i think it's kind of cool like i'm confused and i really wish that pike would tell us what is happening <laughs> but <laughs> i am glad that he is like really open and like having us figure it out well not us it's like us but like yeah. people readers no specifically us yeah just he, us just us he nobody wants else us to figure it out yeah <laughs> this is our like, task and our mission we have to figure this yeah. story out we are detectives not just podcasters <laughs> okay <laughs> why don't we move on to thirst where we talk about titillation and sexuality in Pike's world, because this is one of the things that separates Pike from the other point horror and other young adult horror of the day. Sex was implied there. Sex is here in these books. Yeah. And I have text to go along with that. I just want to give the, the silliest quote about sexuality is and it was in that barn that I lost my virginity after a thorough examination by Dr. Pepper. Oh, my God. <laughs> Can I just say that that is a line I actually remember from the book oh, really? from when I was a kid? Yes. <laughs> that was iconic. Very titillating for me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why he's named Pepper, that. so that they can use that line. <laughs> just specifically for that no, line. That's yeah, a, I, mean, Pike, you know, I have to write this line. And so he named him Pepper. So let's let's talk about the sex in this book. There is there is implied sex, there's uh actual sex, there's weird possible rape, possible sex. Like if she's controlling them, isn't she raping them? That's what I was gonna say. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. And that's that's definitely a modern way to view this because I, I believe in 91, we would have come on the side of, you can't rape a man mm -hmm. back then. But now, uh, yeah, that, there are some very, very odd consent issues in this book. And again, because we don't know what Betty Sue's endgame is, we don't actually know where the consent violations happened. It's true. But there's there's a lot of these little things that that are very Pike esque. Uh, what the hell? I thought I needed sex and romance in my life. <laughs> uh, here here it is. Here we kissed some more, and I let him touch my breasts. But we didn't make love, or maybe we did make love because I was already in love with him. I Aww. don't know why. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very, um, it's very melodrama. It's very high school, but it's also, and this is really what impressed me about this book overall was like, I felt the quality of writing was a step up from die softly. And I don't know if that's because he was writing first person. So he was giving this writing quality to rocks. Or if this was a more important book to him, so he spent... Because both of these books now came out the same year. Uh, Die Softly was early in the year. Whisper of Death came out in December of 91. So it's really like close together to have such a difference in the writing quality. And again, it it reinforced to me why I loved it so much when I was younger, because I was so engaged from the moment I picked it up again to the end, like just on board with every weird plot choice he made. It's like, yeah, fucked up. I don't know what, but I'm there. I'm there for it. I'm, he I'm here for it, <laughs> which is not really about the sex right now so we should get back to that <laughs> because uh the sex was better than ice cream 
It was I, like that a was summer a quote night. That I wrote down. Yeah, before was, summer really began. Before school let out. <laughs> yeah, before school let out. It's like what is? But what I love is, it. I love those little things. Me too. I I I wrote down another line that I actually really liked. That was um, I was happy in his arms, like. Like I was that night we were together in the arms of the stars. I felt so yes. much a part of him that I honestly believed for a long time afterward that I could be a part of everything. I really like that. <laughs> yeah. It's, She's it's so sweet. extensive and, and big, not little internal. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's, you know, as somebody who's been a teenage girl and who has had a boyfriend that, you know, you felt those ways about, like, it's very... It's very real, like all how big it feels and how like they're staring up at the stars and they're just like having this amazing romantic moment where the whole entire world just ceases to exist. And then, you know, there's all this terrible stuff that comes next, which is really I just love Christopher Pike's books with that. Like, <laughs> here's this nice, sweet moment between these two young teenagers. Uh oh. Here comes bad news. <laughs> well, it, it's one step away from Stephen King writing at the end of the chapter, and she would never see him again. <laughs> it's like oh fuck you king <laughs> i like them together <laughs> so yeah there's 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 some sex in here uh and it's titillating i suppose i really enjoyed it as a young adult i remember well i just i read these books i think before i had ever ever dated or kissed anybody or anything so it was like a very high standard <laughs> that I really, I mean, I just loved these books for ha well, this book in particular for having this very like perfect seeming romance, at least at the beginning. Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause you buy it as a young adult. Mm -hmm. Whereas, whereas us in our jaded <laughs> uh, future look back and say, Oh my God, stupid. Come on. Yeah. What's wrong with you? That's me. <laughs> <laughs> But but as as uh, you know, I read this probably when I was twelve, maybe thirteen. So I had not dated anybody, and I was still amazed by how adult high schoolers seemed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it it it's uh, it really reinforced. Like I don't know if I read this first. I don't know if I read this last. But this was the one that made me a Pike fan without question, because this one drew me in more than any of those um, junk food young adult books. And I'm not saying junk food in a negative way, but those point horrors are like Big Macs. You really enjoy it while you're reading it. And then it just kind of goes away. Mm -hmm. You know, They don't stick with you. Yeah. Yeah. But this, this stuck. And I think that's really a testament to his writing because I mean, there is a reason we're all thinking about him. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be thirty years next year after these were published. Wow! Yeah, I hadn't even done the math. <laughs> <laughs> I know makes you feel old, right? <laughs> um, I think we have to mention too, just a, it, since we're talking about the thirst section here. Yeah. Um, one of the things that stood out to me the most that I remembered the most from this story, reading it when I was younger. Um, was the hay and the scene with the pitchfork yes. and how Pepper dies. And can we just for a moment, just even outside of the story, when I was 14, 15, reading this book for the first time, I thought hay was going to be sexy. I thought it was going to be soft. I thought it was going to be comfy. And I thought that was going to be a good place to get some kind of time with some kind mm -hmm, of person. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, <laughs> hay is not comfy. Hay makes you sneeze. Hay is itchy. Hay is awful. It's terrible. Uh -huh. And it smells. It smells weird. There's like this weird musty sort of smell to it. Yeah. Why there? Why there? Why? I write <laughs> that down. I was like, a hay bale is not like a giant bed. <laughs> right? No. That exactly. Yes. Like what I thought it would be. So when I went to sit on one as a kid, I was like, oh, my butt is hard here. This is a good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, especially hay that is so unbaled that it could hide a pitchfork. Yeah, right. That's that's hay that's floating through the air at that point. You you lay down on that. You go. You do poof. You know. Yeah. It was, um, just, it was weird. It was a trove. I I've never actually had hay sex, but I can imagine 
it would uh, it would be awful, really. That seems very. I have hay fever, so (laughs) yeah. Some kind of hydrocodone cream afterwards, or something. Yeah, well, I mean that could be sensual. You just rub each other down with that. That's what I like to do at the end of my hay walk. (laughs) Get the old anti-itch cream and give me a rub down. (laughs) It's strong two percent hydrocodone. All you know, all I can think about with that, and I'm probably showing my age again, is Monica and friends sick using the Vicks vapor rub on her chest and saying, "Don't you want to get with this?" <laughs> <laughs> so with that, let's move on to die softly, where we talk about moralizing and problematic elements in the writing and plot. We've already talked about the most problematic element, the uh, weird vacillating feels between pro-choice and uh, pro-life, I guess, is still the stupid terms for it. But there are a lot of little pike things that I've noticed. I Now reading these in succession, again, we have teenagers just casually smoking cigarettes and drinking beer, just casually. Uh, Pepper, when when we meet him, says, I'm a beer man myself. Uh, Rox says, I knew smoking dope was a lousy thing to do, but I did it anyway. That's, That's again. Too, yeah, the, the uh, there's a reason they call it dope, which was the line in the last book about. So, yeah, you know, there's that. Um. About smoking, it was a dirty habit anyway. It ruined your lungs. It gave you cancer. It cut short your life. It made you cough, particularly when you were just starting to smoke again. Wow. There's a lot there. (laughs) So what do you think about uh, the... Do you think this is moralizing or do you think it is trying to speak from the way kids are... Uh, indoctrinated to feel. I feel like Pike might be the reason I never picked up smoking cigarettes as a child. <laughs> wow, well, that, that? that's a yeah, that's a big I, one. Are you afraid you touch the way fire? that like, you, you <laughs> yeah? I mean, can I tell you? I didn't realize until rereading this again. But that's always been a fear. I'm like, you cannot smoke when you're pumping gas. Like, you can't do that. You can't do that. You're going to explode. You're going to die. Oh yeah. And I I would tell my mom she'd get out of the car with a cigarette. I'm like, no, you can't do this. <laughs> And you can trace that back to Pike. (laughs) So many things I'm finding I can trace back to Pike. So if he's listening, thanks, sir. (laughs) Though I will will point out that Mythbusters has shown that you can't just drop a cigarette into uh, a gas on the ground and have it ignite. Don't tell my mom that. (laughs) I won't. Don't worry. (laughs) Because you want to try it? I don't know. She'll just be like, all these years, you were lying to me. (laughs) (laughs) So we do have a few more uh, major lessons about abortion and sex. Uh, Apparently, the surgeons like to get rid of nasty business early so they could spend the rest of the day saving lives. Nasty business. Huh. I suppose the thought of contraceptives crossed my mind after we were done. But that's the same as thinking about your parachute after you've jumped. You can think all you want. The ground doesn't give a damn. I liked that line. The ground. I did it too. Yeah, that's that was good. That's good stuff. And I even that was one of the ones I highlighted when I read that. I looked it up to make sure that the morning after pill wasn't available in the U.S. yet when this was written. It wasn't, right? No, it wasn't. No. <laughs> yeah, she wouldn't have known how to get it anyway in her little tiny small town. Yeah, nowhere. I have guns in Vegas. <laughs> well, well, everywhere's got guns. I mean, come on. Your small town anywhere's got guns. Fair. Weed, I'm sure it comes in from the neighboring major metropolitan area. The same place where these kids get the cocaine they take. Yes, yes, they take it. <laughs> um, there's also this great one. It was more fun getting into this predicament than it is getting out of it. I love that. Oh, this, yeah. <laughs> I love that too. 
Like, I want to be the Here's the problem one. About her abortion. <laughs> right before. Oh, go, go on. I'm sorry. What did you say? Oh, I just said I want to be the kind of girl who has, like, the gumption to make a joke about her abortion right beforehand. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, this one uh, stood out to me. I didn't want her to think I was queer or anything. Yes. Which was Rox's way of saying why she didn't look at uh, Betty Sue in the shower. I was like, did so, that need to be there? Like, I have um, I have one part highlighted. So it's not really like good or bad writing. It's just I thought it was funny. Um, and there were a lot of parts that I thought were humorous. So since I have some good news and I have some bad news, what do you want to hear first? Yes. Who hesitated? The good news. It's yours. What's mine? <laughs> The bad news. What? The baby. <laughs> that part, I was laughing. I was like, what a way to tell oh, him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That is the best pregnancy announcement of all time. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was so good. Like, <laughs> yeah. And and I think that, that can bring us into the season of passage where we talk about the best and worst writing in the book and pikeisms. But yeah, that that really was one of the things that reinforced her, you know, just like dame dialogue. Like, yeah, see, you know, it just like she's witty. She's she throws it back, you know, that's it's great. I wanna read the opening passage of this book because I think it's excellent. I sit alone in a dead world. The wind blows hot and dry, and the dust gathers like particles of memory waiting to be swept away. I pray for forgetfulness, yet my memory remains strong, as does the outstretched arm of the oppressive air. It seems as if the wind has been there since the beginning of the nightmare, sometimes loud and harsh, a thousand sharp needles scratching at my reddened skin, sometimes a whisper a curious sigh in the black of night of words more frightening than pain. That's a great opening. I love how yeah, I like when that. she's sitting down at Betty Sue's, like it just comes back around to that like passage. Yeah. Loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, yeah. Okay. So it hit me with some of your, your, your writing thoughts. Do you have, do you have quotes? Yes, I'll read one. Because I've got tons, and I don't want to. I don't want to read them. All. Yeah. Um. Suddenly, I was afraid. Afraid of nothing. That, that most awful of fears, especially when nothing is all there is. Like that's spooky. Yeah. Loves it. Yeah. I, yeah. Love that. <laughs> I had that one too. <laughs> Cassie, what do you got? I have another one that was just her being sarcastic. <laughs> They say, don't worry. She says, I won't worry. I said sarcastically sitting back, I'll take these few moments to enjoy a peaceful meditation. <laughs> <laughs> and that made me laugh, too, because I was like, damn, she is so snarky when she does not need to be for the situation. And I love it. Like, it's yeah. so good. <laughs> Claire, do you have any favorite quotes? Um. Well, yeah, just going back to her dialogue, because I just loved it. There was one part where she's, I just thought it was so funny. She said, oh, this is not my day. First, I go for an abortion. Then I end up in the twilight zone. <laughs> yeah. It's like, man, yeah, it's been a rough day. <laughs> there's, uh, there's this, uh, oh, where is it? Oh, yeah. The, uh, the come on here. What do you want to do? He asked. I brushed her his hair back. What comes easiest? I loved that. Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> bounced, bounced. <laughs> uh, but but going toward uh, really impressive lines, uh, a garrote of silver wire spun from a nightmare recorded in black ink on a page of white notebook paper. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. There are these Boom. little snippets, yeah, that are just like, dang, that is gold. <laughs> I've got more. There was no one around. The sight of a corpse would have been welcome to me right then. A skeleton sitting at a kitchen table with a fresh cup of steaming coffee. Sure, let me meet him. I'm desperate. I like wow. that a lot. Yeah, that's really good to the, like, the loneliness and how desolate yeah. they feel. Yeah. I have this one for and after Pepper dies. 
and he's on the pitchfork. Mm. <laughs> and she goes, I looked at him, struggling like a pinned butterfly, trying to free itself of a painful needle, and I could not understand. Yeah. That's I like good that. Stuff. Scary. And it brings it back to Betty Sue, too. So. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I really, as as a former Catholic, I really like this observation of Betty Sue's room. Here there were no disturbing paintings of pierced and bleeding saints. She made her room like really basic and like neutral. And this is this is the most pulpy line of all, I think. Time did not go by. That would have been a joke. Time had already packed its bags and left town. <laughs> Just so good. <laughs> I also liked um, towards the beginning when she's talking about herself, she says, I seldom smiled because I felt haunted and cursed. Yeah, that's deep. Yeah. That's that's. I uh... thought that was interesting because it kind of is never elaborated on whatsoever. No. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, just like being a teen, I was I feel like I was like, yeah, I'm haunted and cursed, too. <laughs> <laughs> I myself am strange and unusual. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I found an interesting thing, and I don't know if this is a direct correlation, but it feels like it might be. In my novel, As Good Is Gone, there's a dream she has where there's no clouds, no stars in the sky. And when I read this passage, there were no clouds in the sky, no haze, no smoke, and there were no stars either. Betty Sue must have failed to write them in. She probably knew how much I loved them. I wondered if my subconscious had remembered the fear of seeing an empty sky with no stars, because it's a vast fear. You know, it's a, a cosmic fear. That's interesting. I remember that part of your book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank. Good, it stood out. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> that's me though. I think that is very creepy. And that that's just like one of the first signs that you're in an off-kilter world. Without question. Okay, do you you said you have some pikeisms, Cassie? <clears throat> um, well, so I have one, and it was just uh early on in the book. He's talking about or well, actually she's talking about a movie and she says it was a horror film about the second expedition to Mars called the season of passage. Yeah. Um, I love that he puts that in there. Cause that's one of his other books. And he does that a lot. Like he'll put little nods or little snippets or stories within stories of his books that are his other books. Mm -hmm. And every time I see that, or every time I pick up on it, I'm like, yes, yes, I know that. And I feel like I'm part of like some kind of club or something. And I love it. And I'm so excited about it. <laughs> It's uh, it's funny because in this interview I read with him, he talks about how um, The Season of Passage was one of his first books that he wrote. And when they actually got around to letting him do some adult books, he completely rewrote it and changed the story. So it makes me wonder if this horror story about the second expedition to Mars was the original story for The Season of Passage. Hmm. The Pikeisms I noticed most, um, let's see. Well, first of all, I mean, okay, we've got Desert Town. There's a lot of that in Pike. We've got uh, weird overemphasis on some procedures. Like in this one, we get a lot of description of abortion procedures. Uh, I, I really liked that people in his stories – just like to give out the last four digits of their phone number as though, I mean, I, I guess it's a different time, but I never lived somewhere where everyone had the same prefix. That Have could be you? because it's really small because they're all such small towns. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't either. No, I haven't. I lived in Orlando and I remember when we got area codes, but. Yeah. Always... I remember that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's talk about bad or bizarre quotes. I, the, the bizarre one I have is, how many of you have heard of the Bermuda Triangle? Are those new bikinis that show off a girl's butt? Helter asked. I patted Helter's hand. I don't think you got that one right. <laughs> that just stood out as being such a weird, weird response. 
I wrote down um, when she's planning on getting the abortion, she says she's like beating herself up, I guess. And she says, I would throw away the price of love to be in love. <laughs> yeah, It just yeah. stuck out at me as like a very overwrought thing. <laughs> That is that is teen romance yeah. in a in a nutshell. There, <laughs> I probably should have put this in the problematic portion. Our child probably would have been retarded. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I I so there's that. <laughs> I remember reading uh, that. Thinking, Ooh, this is going to come up in the episode. <laughs> yeah, this one really stood out as being odd to me. We got flashlights, fresh batteries. I changed my shirt. I had whole stores to choose from. It was wonderful. A shopper's dream. I left on my bloody pants. They had become a part of me. What the fuck is that? Why? Can I just I don't know. If I was shot in the leg, I would I would have cried a lot more in the book if I was that character. She yeah, just she's like incredibly got blasé about it. Yeah, <laughs> it just grazed me. It's not. Yeah. A, it's not inside my leg. No big deal, guys. I didn't it's even realize <laughs> that she had gotten shot at first. Yeah, because she's so cool about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, like I literally exploded or something on her. <laughs> she forgets she got shot, <laughs> and and then oh yeah, I got shot. It's like what the hell? <laughs> like, wouldn't you be you limping? Got shot. Wouldn't you be like limping? Like. The entire time, like how I would you, think so. Like it's not gonna, it's not gonna feel good. Like to be shot. She's like, I've never been shot before, but she's like, <laughs> kind of acting like it's like an everyday occurrence. Like this is cool. I'm like I'm fine. I'm walking. I'm doing great. And it happens so early on, like yeah. Without- and then she goes through the rest of the book like that, and they don't really mention it again. <laughs> they like don't. Time. Just like I forgot about it. I forgot she was injured. I mean, and this is also, I think, after she shot Helter, so that means she's covered in blood and her blood and she still doesn't want to change her jeans when she's got as she said a shopper's dream of stores choices i don't know but you know uh there there's an obscure west craven movie called vampire in brooklyn where eddie murphy is a vampire and he gets shot and he says i've never been shot before kind of itches a little <laughs> so yeah that's basically her reaction to being shot kind of itches a little it's very strange and that was part of the reason i really didn't like pepper because after she got shot i was just thinking how are you not you're just the worst yes. boyfriend ever you're not taking care of her and your girlfriend just got just shot <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he but like- he's more worried about giving his handkerchief to to the sobbing blonde girl yeah <laughs> like he didn't even try to try to wrap the handkerchief around her leg and do like a or tear off part of his shirt like come on be the the macho guy oh, serious she notices too she's like he didn't give me that handkerchief <laughs> yeah. she looks down at her gushing leg she's like motherfucker she is pregnant with his baby right that part too like how are you not protecting her at all costs right now like get in front of her what the heck okay now i do have a thought on her wound. If you take it as this is a dream, she has begun to bleed on the operating table. And she's not paying enough attention to that. So there's that. Okay. I can see it. Yeah, it's true. It's still weird. (laughs) It's still really weird. That might follow some of, like, it, not to give spoilers for his other books since we aren't there yet, but there are a couple of other ones where that sort of happens, where it's like you're, you should be aware of something and he kind of hints at it throughout, mm. but it doesn't really clearly, like, solidly tell you that that's what it is until later or if at all. And that's the dream logic thing again. Like, there's there's often dreams where you'll feel like you should be aware of something, but you're just not paying attention to it or you should be doing something, but you're just not doing it. And I, I feel like he captures that very well. He does. Yeah. And in toward the end too, even at the end of the book where um, Pepper's driving off with the girl and he's kind of like, I kind of have, she's familiar to me. I, I kind of have this vibe that I know her, but I, I don't really have that. Like I can't capture mm-hmm. it. Like you're saying. Mm-hmm. Okay. Shall we move to the last act? Yes. Here is the part of the show where we give our overall 
thoughts and ratings of the book. This is out of five pikes. And last, uh, last time we said that there could be a head on a pike and that could be a half or there were heads on pikes. And that was like more, I don't know. It's, it's however you interpret it. Five (laughs) pikes are, is the maximum. Let's start with our guest, Claire. Where do you put this? What what rating do you give it? I personally would probably give it a four or a five. Yeah. I really enjoy You want to go with four and a half to be uh sure. right there in the middle? Sure. I don't want to like four shoot overshoot it, but <laughs> I, <laughs> there's it's okay. You will not be held to these ratings. <laughs> <laughs> but um I really, really enjoyed it. I, this is one of the few pikes that I actually kind of remember, to be honest. Like, I don't remember most of them, but this one I kind of remembered and it definitely Mm -hmm. stuck with me over time. Um, I think for that same reason, I'm going with five. I loved this book and I don't care that the antagonist plan didn't make any fucking sense. (laughs) And I can overlook the abortion thing, too, because we're living in the world where that all happened in the middle, which means she was killed. The abortion didn't kill her. I agree. I can go along with that. I agree. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, Becca, where you at? I am going to give it less than you guys. (laughs) Oh, well, that's okay. I'm thinking probably 3.5, like I gave the last one. Um, oh, well, maybe just a half. three. Okay. I'm going to give it a, okay. okay. So if I compare okay. this one to die softly, I like this one less. Mm-hmm. So maybe we should really? go three. Okay. Yes. Um, like I said, I do enjoy as much as I wish that we had answers to a lot of things. I did enjoy the openness of it so that we can kind of like put our own thoughts into the book and not just have it flatly told out to us. Like I really enjoyed that part, but I just, I don't know. It was kind of average to me, like as a whole. And that is where I'm at on that. Um, I'm going to even us back around and give it four pikes and a head, a pike head. uh, Not pike's actual head, but just a pike head on (laughs) a pike. Who is it this time? Last time it was, uh, wasn't it Sammy? This time, oh, yeah. Oh, actually, so actually, so I'm going to do four pikes and a pitchfork. Oh, nice. a, pepper, a pepper pitchfork. Um, and so I, I don't want to give it five, even though I really, really love this one, because there are a couple of other Pike books that I I, I hold to a higher esteem and I love a lot, okay. a little bit more. So I want to reserve my fives for the the few that I have that are like my all time jam. Um, gotcha. And this is in my top five as well. So I'm going to go ahead with four and a half. I really, really liked it. I like I like that this one has such an air of loneliness because I think that stuck with me a lot oh, as yeah. a kid. It's just the world is empty and that's terrifying and it doesn't have a happy ending. And the person that I like does not live. And I always like sad shit. So this is my jam and I loved it. (laughs) And that is two for two now where the protagonist is dead at the end of the book. I love a tragic ending. I think that's another thing that I loved as a team. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love that now too. I'm like, make me cry, please. I love it. (laughs) Can I throw an extra pike just for Stan? In honor, in honor of Stan, can I give one more pike? Stan Pike. Yeah. You, you don't need to give a reason for your pikes, but you can specifically identify a pike as being yes. for Stan. Yes. We're adding we're adding a Stan Pike to this one. Oh. You can Stan in this book. Yes, we do. <laughs> With that, why don't we wrap it up and say Claire? Will you tell our listeners about your book? Yes, thank you. Um, so my book is called I Am Not Your Final Girl, and it's a bunch of poems from the perspectives of final girls, as you might imagine. <laughs> and I have twisted Claire's arm and asked her to read our listeners a poem from her book. Ooh, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> no, I'm excited to. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't. I couldn't read that that tone there. <laughs> Side eyes. Thanks, Cooper. <laughs> Thanks. Great. 
<laughs> no, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to read Lori from Halloween since it is October. So this is Lori. I ask you to tell me of a town where this hasn't happened, where some brute dressed in black hasn't donned a mask, shadowed a woman, called himself a monster to blot out his own mortality. Tell me why I should mythologize this. Let his shape grow larger than the women crouched with coat hangers, with makeshift daggers as sturdy as their hearts. Something can be vulnerable and powerful both at once, but you cannot understand this, and I have grown so weary trying to explain. You say you want to protect us, that the method, blunt pills forced to mouths, a technique for hysteria, is all wrong. It abrades. White fences are only made of wood. They splinter so easily. I love that one. That was one of my absolute favorites from the book when I read it. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> that book is so good. And to all our listeners, even if you you would normally be like, I don't really read a lot of poetry or anything like that, please, you need to try because it's so good, especially yeah. if you're a fan, I, not only, but especially if you're a fan of horror and you've read a lot of these or you've seen a lot of these movies that the poems are inspired by. They're just, there's so many levels to them. And I love them so much. Claire, you're so good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so same. much. <laughs> I would like to say that this is like the book that got me into reading poetry so thank that's you Claire. amazing thank you that's so cool to hear honestly so claire where can our listeners find you online and where can they get your book um so the book is available through amazon um i have my website clarecholland.com and then you can find me on most social media my handle is claire C. Writes also I mean, it's just Claire C. Writes. <laughs> <laughs> Not also. No also in there. <laughs> Becca, where can we find you online? Yes. I have a blog. It is as told by Bex dot wordpress dot com. I have a Twitter that is also as told by Bex, minus the also also. <laughs> <laughs> that one thrown off anyway <laughs> so, so we should just remove all alsos from yeah. our, our listeners minds no alsos <laughs> in, don't listen in to us things. ever say also <laughs> anyway and my instagram is read with bex and cassie i know you're you're in the midst of some problems with your instagram but let's oh. pretend they've been solved by the time this is released <laughs> um yeah so i i'm just gonna give my new instagram actually because okay. i don't i don't have any faith that the old one uh, <laughs> oh, is ever going to be reactivated which sucks because it's a lot of a lot of effort and time i put into it but yeah. um i do have a blog it's let's get galactic.com um i sell art and diy embroidery kits and things like that and a coloring book i actually made recently so you can find that at let's get galactic art.etsy.com and then um i am on twitter as c-t-r-l-a-l-t cassie so it's control alt cassie like on your keyboard and then my instagram is now newly at reading in a prism so if you have my old instagram you won't be able to find it anymore because it's gone so please go find that new one and let's be friends on there because i would really love that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Fuck cooper instagram. tell us about yours oh, I, I will thank you <laughs> um I had I had a question about yours, but I can't remember it now. Oh, dang, oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, before I do that, Cassie, you have a new book coming out that people can pre-order. I do. I do. You're better at my marketing than I am, Cooper. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Tell I actually, us about it. <laughs> it's called You're Out of This World. It's a witchy planner and workbook. So it's got... Um, a lot of different kinds of self-love activities in it um, that are focused on witchiness and also just on general loving yourself and feeling good about yourself and getting to know yourself a little bit more. Um, the book is over 65 pages long, and it's also got some coloring pages and 12-month calendar pages for you to plan the next year of your life. And you can pre-order that now in my Etsy. That's awesome, and and sounds like something that is very needed for the let's just say chaotic times we are living in. 
Yes. Yeah. Honestly, I, I started making it with the intention of having one printed so that I could use it next year. Um, and I showed a couple of friends and they were super into it. So I was like, yeah, I'm giving this to people. Here you go. So it's going to it's going to be shipped out November 15th so that everybody can get it before the new year. That's awesome. OK, for me, you can find me at Cooper S. Beckett dot com and at Cooper S. Beckett on all the social medias. Uh, because of the aforementioned chaotic nature of the times, if you are not interested in my political opinions, do not follow me on Twitter because I am very vocal about them on Twitter. And I believe I'm on the right side of history. So let's just go on from that. <laughs> uh, my audiobook version of my horror novels, As Good as Gone and As Good Riddens, are coming very soon and you can listen to a special sneak preview of them at the end of our die softly episode at the end there's a preview of my audiobook so check that out now cassie i'm going to have you do the the show's information all right so we uh the podcast is on all social media you can find us on twitter on instagram and on facebook under the podcast it's all one word um we'd love it if you'd follow us if you tweet us we have a hashtag going called hashtag show us your pike so you can show us the books that you're reading that are christopher pikes whether they're the books that we're going to be covering on the show recently or soon or not um and then we also have a patreon which is very exciting and if you're a supporter of our patreon you get some really cool stuff like podcast merch, bookmarks, t-shirts. Um, you actually get access to a special edition digital version of my coloring book, as well as the digital copy of Cooper's book, As Good As Gone. Yeah. So it's a lot of good little like fun stuff that you can get there. Um, and we'd really love to have you interact with us online because that's kind of, it's our whole thing, you know, being social, talking to you guys about these books. We're really excited for it. And if you'd like to go one step more, you can also join our group on Goodreads. And that's also under the podcast. It's Read With The Podcast. Now, listeners, your homework for the next episode is to read The Midnight Club. And we will be talking about that in two weeks on the podcast. So, ladies, thank you for a wonderful discussion. Thank you again, Claire, for joining us. I'm so happy you were able to. Thank you so and much for having me. <laughs> it, it is just it is so much fun talking about these books again. I am, I'm having a blast. So that's it for this week's The Pikecast. Bye. You survived the night, friends. You can peek out from under your covers and see the first blues of dawn out the window. Thanks for spending the night with The Pikecast. And we hope You'll join us again next time. Until then, pikers, pleasant dreams. I'm Cassie. Sorry, we didn't go over which one of us was first this time. <laughs> we didn't. Sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry. We're doing great. No, it's okay. <laughs> okay, it's okay, I will go first if that's okay with you guys. Yes, yes, yes that is fine. Do I just go now or are you going to start over? Okay, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you the the, the lead in again. <laughs> we're professionals at this. It's fine, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we know what we're doing. <laughs> My lovely co-hosts. <laughs>